This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, it's Steve. Welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. With me, as always, is Ken Roybal. Ken, hello. It is, it is I. Hello. It's, I'm it's sorry. Like, I was just. <laughs> it's like we're doing this for a second time. It's so weird. I, I was just thinking of something funny. <laughs> That's all. So uh, we we talked for about uh, two minutes, and I had not hit record. So now now we're going to record what we're saying. We're going to go live again, live. Making this, this a real. podcast. Okay. <laughs> um, today, we have a 28-year veteran of LAPD, Ken's alma mater. His um, name is Guillermo Garitia. What do you think about that? Guillermo. Guillermo, Guillermo. Guillermo. Got it. Well, he goes by Bill, which is good for me. Bill's um, good for you, yeah. It's good for my, for my white mouth. Um, <laughs> so he's been on the job, or he was on the job 28 years. He was a P1, through a P3, retired a sergeant, and he worked Wilshire. 77th and central. So he's got some stories. Yeah. Yeah. He's been, he was all around. I, I've known him for all those years, but I think he came on after me, uh, but still he came on in the eighties. We'll, we'll find out though. Excellent. And I had a question for you, the, the P one ranks, can you, does anybody ever go from a P one to a Sergeant or do you, is it usually P two P three jump? Now P one's a probationer. So you're on probation right out oh. of the Academy for a year. And if you pass probation, you automatically get bumped to P2. Police officer two. Got it. They say those guys that do a career at P2 are, um, are crazy men because they stay they're in badass. Patrol. They pay yeah, in patrol, they're, they're, patrol for too long. They're the backbone of the department. P2s are the backbone of the department. B.A. Baracus. All right, should I, um, <laughs> should I dial in Bill? Dial in Bill, man. Let's get him online. Here we go. Bill, welcome to the podcast, sir. Well, good morning. Welcome, uh, welcome to my house. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming on, man. We um, you've had you had quite the career at LAPD, twenty eight years, um, from P one to P three to sergeant. Um, sounds like you got some stories. I do. I have quite a few. Excellent. And you know Ken? Yeah, I worked with Kenny for a while. Oh. Hey, Bill. I know. I've known. Uh, I was at Wilshire in eighty. I got there in eighty two. It, was it 82? It, when did you get there, Bill? I got there in 84, right after okay. graduation. All right, all right. Yeah, I, knew, I remember you were there a couple of years after me, but uh, yeah, we were go back to the 80s. So we can get yeah. some dirt on Ken here, maybe. Mm. <laughs> he always had that nice mustache. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good mustache, I have to agree. I yeah. am blessed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we go way back. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We had some, uh, you were working morning watch too, were you? When, when uh, you I, I hated morning watch. So I wasn't there very often, very long. Uh, mostly uh, PMs or mid PMs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was probably during that time that we actually met because uh, on probation, I was on morning watch the first whatever months I was there. Yeah. Yeah. We were, it was so long ago, Steve, that, uh, uh, I was handsome and Bill had hair, so that was <laughs> yeah. a long time ago. So, well, you know, I I would still have my hair, but you know, I did something in uh, 2004 that uh, was very profound to do, and I actually showed my neighbor a lot of support by doing it. Uh, she had cancer, and every time she went in for therapy, she'd lose her hair. So at the last time I said, Hey, you know, how's, how are they going to do with your hair? And she goes, Oh, they're going to give me some vitamins and all that. So I won't lose it. And I said, okay. And I talked to her husband and I said, look, if anything changes, you let me know because I promised her I would lose my hair if she lost hers. And I was balding already anyway. So one day I looked at him and said, Hey, um, how is Evelyn doing? And he goes, uh, this is like a peeled onion. And said, okay. Peeled onion. Yeah. Mm. So wow. I went over to my, and I said, hey, shave it. And he goes, I can't. <laughs> I go, wait a minute, you're a barber. Shave it. He says, I can't. I'll take it down to as little as I can possibly take it down to, but the rest is up to you. Mm. Scare the crap out of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you stuck and with it. Captain the next day, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, nothing yeah. wrong with a bald head. It's a good look. Mm -mm. No, yeah. that's a very cool thing to do for your neighbor. Yeah, hey, you know, been like this since 2004. I'm very proud. And, uh, you know, I liked it anyway, so I kept it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Looks good. 
<laughs> so, Bill, can, can you take us back to uh, 1984 for your first year on the job, for the, to the first time you had a call that um, you would consider a hot call that kind of got your blood pumping? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the very first night, actually, I was working with a young lady by the name of Sharon Michelson. Sharon? Uh, yeah. She's a friend of mine, yeah. I know her and her and her uh, two brothers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't remember the, the call sign of the car, but uh, we were the first ones to get the call. It was a code three call. And uh, it was uh, somewhere south of Washington. And um, it was uh, a shooting call. And uh, what happened was we went there. By the time we got there, uh, another unit had already arrived and had a suspect in custody and had a shotgun. So uh, Sharon says, you stay with the suspect. I'm going to go find out what the hell happened. She was a P3 at the time and my instructor. So I said, okay. So I started getting information on the guy and I started getting his story. And his story was that... uh, this gentleman that uh, he was involved with that night had come over and had stolen a car from him. And I go, stolen a car from you? I said, uh, how? He says, well, I have a business of repairing cars, he says. And uh, this guy had brought the car over, had asked me to repair it, but I didn't have time to repair it. And uh, a couple of weeks had gone by, and he came over today arguing with me that I hadn't worked on his car at all. and. Uh, he says, well, you know, if you're not going to work on my car, he says, I'll just take it. And he managed to get it out of the uh, parking lot where it was in his uh, work area, I mean, his shop, and got it onto the street and was actually pushing the car down the street. So he says, he took that car from me. He says, so I got my shotgun and I went over and, you know, I was telling him to bring it back. Uh, well, okay, well, don't tell me anymore, I said, because you need to talk to detectives. And sure enough, Sharon comes back and uh, he says, yeah, people saw him. You know, they uh, they saw him grab the guy, put the shotgun to his neck and started walking him over back to the thing after, you know, the car was stopped. Mm -hmm. Starts walking him over to his office. And uh, somehow he had his finger on the trigger. Oh, no. uh, Mm -hmm. He stumbled. Mm -mm. And as he stumbled, off he went. So blew the guy's head off. Oh, geez. Oh, my goodness. So that was my very first call. <laughs> and with shotguns, man, all you got to do is breathe on the trigger and that it fires. Is, yep. Oh, so, not. He must have been watching too many action movies. Well, you know, later on we came to find out, too, that was he in the right for doing that? Absolutely not. Because the men had entrusted him with his car to be repaired. He hadn't done anything. But this guy that, sh- you know, used a shotgun, he kept saying, it's my car. As long as it's in my property, it's my car. And there is no such thing. The owner of that car was the guy that came to get it. He had absolutely no right to say anything about the car except, well, at least pay me some storage fees. But mm. if he had promised to work on the car, I don't think he could have even gotten away with that. That's some crazy yeah. logic, man. <laughs> give your car to the mechanic, yeah. you won't give it back. And yeah. Steve, just so you know that that what the 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 call that uh, Bill's describing happened all the time in Wilshire in the eighties, all the time. People's heads getting blown off with shotguns, or the mechanics oh, yeah. lean. People just shooting all the time, it just murders all the time. It was terrible. Oh my gosh! Well, not 80s. terrible for the cops, but you know, the eighties were really bad in New York too. It was just a lot of shootings. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a uh, that that is a crazy. Um, first call were you did you um you know did you just hang back mostly and and uh observe or i mean you talked to that one guy but that must have been uh, a little bit of a shock to your system oh yeah no that was a shock to my system completely because i had never you know ever uh been in a situation like that now in that particular one i didn't even get to go see the body because i was with with in custody of the uh of the shooter and our job then became, okay, we're going to take the shooter over and then we're just going to, you know, do the paperwork on him and wait for detectives to come in. And then the other unit, I don't remember who it was. So they were the ones that were watching the body there until the coroner came in and picked it up. But that was the very first call. Wow. It, well, Ken, just from hearing your stories, Ken, it seems like at LAPD at that time, they would, they, uh, they would have made a point to make you look at it, you know? Uh, yeah. And I was just, uh, Bill, you were on probation at the time. Yep. My yeah, very first he, day. 
normally normally they would have they would have had Bill uh, go uh, pick up the body with the coroner and and put him in the van and all that kind of stuff and make sure you know because that's part of training is to look at that stuff. But sure. uh, uh, then again, there's this other thing where you have to when you're on a homicide scene. Uh, there has to be a homicide log that started, uh, and every single person that enters that crime scene area, you have to log That's their name. Cool. So there's so a lot of times it was the P1s who were just kind of, you know, everybody's doing all this stuff, and you're standing there with your clipboard writing people's names down as they came in and as they left. And so he might have, I don't know if you were doing that or not, Bill. No, no, like I said, uh, Sharon uh, told me just to stay with the suspect until she went over and found out what it what had happened, and then uh, she said, okay, we're taking this guy over to Wilshire, and uh, we're going to call the detectives, because this was like maybe 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. What year was that? Well, it was in 1984. I mean, uh, yeah, excuse me, 1985, I'm sorry. I, oh. I graduated in 1985. I'm sorry. I'm so one year early when I'm talking to you guys. Oh, so you were, you were on um, probation at Wilshire? Yes. Oh, I see. Because Sharon, I remember when Sharon was on probation at Wilshire as well. She did her probation in there. And uh, so she must have stayed and became a P3. Uh, Steve, later on, she actually retired as a as a captain. Oh, wow. Um, I think she retired as a commander, Kenny. Uh, maybe. I'd have to check that. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, but she was a captain at uh, 77th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, she went over to commander, yeah. Yeah, very nice lady. Tough lady. Tough hard, lady. Good hard guy. charger. Yeah, and her brother, uh, one brother, Lyle, uh, retired as a P3, and her other brother, Stuart, retired as a detective. And uh, Sharon and Stuart are twins, and I don't know if they came on exactly the same time, but, uh, yeah, they're all three retired now. Bill, yeah, did, um, do, you know, do you know what happened to that guy? Did like, did, Do you know what his no, sentencing was or anything? Uh, no, okay. No, I, we were never called in to uh, go to court or anything. I think the detectives handled everything either because he was already copying out to the fact that he shot the man anyway. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's a great first call, man. Can you can you describe to us a uh, strange or bizarre call that you went to? <laughs> strange or bizarre call? Yeah. The same thing with uh, Sharon Michelson again. Uh, we were working uh, nighttime, you know, midnights. And uh, we got a call that a grandmother had received a phone call from somebody that her grandson had been shot and that he was lying dead somewhere and gave us a street uh, name and more or less where the, uh, the body was supposed to be. Well, Sharon and I used our flashlights looking for this guy, couldn't find him under the cars, couldn't do anything at all except look at ourselves and go, where the hell is he? You know, where the hell is this guy? Well, I think we tried it three, uh, two times. You know, we went looking around for him, and we went back to the grandmother and said, man, we just can't find him. So she said, okay, you know, maybe it's a crank caller. And we left. And this happened twice. So on the third time, she calls up. She goes, I got specific instructions as to where the body is. Weird. And we wrote, you're mm -hmm. kidding. She goes, no. And she said, uh, they told me that he's underneath that red car over there, and, you know, you will find him right there. And I said, okay. So we went back. We located the red car. It was uh, in, parked in front of a, um, um, a bunch of apartments that looked like a courtyard apartment. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a courtyard apartment type uh, situation. They had, like, about uh, six apartments and then two on the uh, – three on one side on, and three on the other, and then – two more on the end of it. So anyway, uh, we looked underneath this red car, and sure enough, there he was. We couldn't find him before because he was small, and they had a crown on the thing, and that hit him as well. So, you know, when we looked at him, uh, it appeared like he had uh, two or three bullet holes in the back of his head. Mm. So this happened about, well, I'd say, three or four o'clock in the morning. And we contacted everybody, and uh, they came in, and, you know, the coroner came in, picked up the body and all that. So now we're thinking, okay, there's got to be some evidence over here with the flashlights. We just couldn't see anything at all either. They were either too bright or not bright enough. You remember those, Kenny? Yep. 
So we waited until daylight, and then we started finding out like 12 shell, ca- uh, shell casings of 22 caliber um, bullets all over the place, but only three of them or two of them had gotten into his head. Hmm. That's really bizarre. So the, the caller, did you say was his mother? No. The caller that initiated the call was his grandmother. Grandmother. That, and she yeah. knew this happened. Yeah. She knew that he had been killed because somebody called her to tell her where he was. But, you know, when we got to the location she had described, the first time we couldn't find him. So we told her that. And she goes, okay, maybe somebody was just crank calling her. Right. And then the second time she called, she goes, they tell me that he's there. But specifically, she couldn't tell us where, so we went and did the same thing we did before. You know, we went to the place two times by ourselves, just by what she had said, and we couldn't see the guy. And like I said, the third time somebody called her, this is exactly where he is, and this is the, the color of the car. And I don't remember if they even gave us the license plate number of the car or not, but you know, whoever <laughs> called it had to have known somebody. And his grandmother wasn't telling us who that caller was either. She just said, somebody called me. Told me my grandson was dead. Yeah, normally murderers don't call and tell you, you know, hey, grandma, here, here's the body. <laughs> right. That seems kind of weird. It's so That's weird. And that, that was the only call. Like the community didn't report it besides that. Cause it sounds like it happened in like on the street. Yeah. I mean, the guy was running for his life and he thought that if he hid underneath a car, he would, you know, be spared. But no. They came in from the sidewalk side and shot him in the back of the head two, two times. I could see two little bullet holes in his head. Wow. And no, no word on, on the backstory to this? Nothing. Nothing at all. Gang related, it, obviously. Probably, but we don't know. I mean, that particular area wasn't well known for having gangs, but, you know, all of Wilshire was a gang place at one time. Mm. Yeah, a lot of gangs out there, a lot of shootings, uh, drive-bys and all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's kind of weird that the way this one went down. Yeah. Yeah. LA really yeah. had a huge gang problem, huh? I remember I got an Uber ride when I was in Los Feliz over to Atwater Village. And the Uber driver was this older guy. And he was talking about how the Atwater Village has changed and Los Feliz has changed. And he was saying when he was a kid, um, gangsters came on his school bus and put a gun to the uh, bus driver's head when they smacked around some kid on his bus. And he mm. said it just, that stuff happened. He said, we'd be on our way to school and gangsters would pull up, put, point guns out the windows and you hit the deck or you'd run or whatever, just to screw with kids, you know? And he said, uh, that's what it was like. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's some of, some of the things that I did not get to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The gangs and <clears throat> the gangs in the eighties were, were really uh, out there and the murders were just skyrocketing. It was pretty bad. And uh, they would shoot each other up all the time, uh, selling dope and just turf wars. And it, it got so out of control. And uh, Chief Gates at the time, he had, uh, uh, Bill, do you remember, I think it was Operation Hammer. Is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, where sure. we just hit the streets and there was just coppers all over the place. They had task forces that were going into South Central and just, uh, they called it Operation Hammer because we were dropping the hammer, you know. And uh, they, and people out in the Inland Empire, San Bernardino, Riverside County, they were, the, the big word was that all the gangsters were going out to the Inland Empire because LA was just flushing them out. And it was back in the time when uh, police, LAPD was very, very proactive and very paramilitary. And if you, if you uh, look like you were going to, I'm sorry. You look shady. (laughs) Yeah. If you look shady, uh, you know, you were going to get jacked up and um, you know, it's not that way anymore, but that's how you kept control as much as you could in a city that was out of control with murders. It was just bad. That is correct. Yeah. I remember in our police academy, they, we did a little study on LAPD a few different times, actually, in, in New York, the bigger agencies. But, um, yeah, they said back in the day, you guys were like a study showed that LAPD was like vastly undermanned, ex- but was able to keep control because of um, the paramilitary style, the strictness. Mm-hmm. 
which was um, yeah. because, you know, LA is such a huge area. And I, I forget the numbers, but back in the day, you guys had like uh, five to 7,000 cops when a study showed that you should have had 15 or something. And um, yeah, just by, just by uh, slapping people around on a daily basis, you were keeping them in line. It's, and that's all it was. Bill knows that you had to go and you had to let them know you were there. And now they call it racial profiling, whatever they want to call it. But you can't have it both ways. You can't. Uh, you can either uh, keep your keep your uh, hand on the situation and and keep the criminal element as suppressed as you can, or you can coddle them and say, "Hey, you have all these rights," and "Hey, you know, go." Can we talk to you? No. Okay, fine. You know, whatever. You can. You can't have it both ways. And uh, crime is gonna. You know, you're gonna pay for it if you if you just let criminals run amok. And it looks like we're still doing that. Yeah. So it was a quite a different time back in the eighties. Oh yeah. When, yep. when men were men and cops were cops. I like cops it. Uh, cops. <laughs> but you know, when we were in the academy, we were a class of a large number of people. I think we started with about sixty some odd people. Some of them would weed it out, of course, because they couldn't handle the, the stress of the physical activity and all that. And, of course, also the uh, academics that went with it. But it was strange that our class that I know of was the only one that was picked one time by the instructors to get on buses in the middle of class, get on buses just with our, you know, PT uniforms that we had in those days. Remember, Kenny? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, our batons and, uh, I think, whistle and handcuffs. That was all that we were required to take with us. And if we were bussed over to the 101 freeway where it intersects, with, uh, turns into the 10 on a left turn, and then it goes into the one, the five, I think. Yeah, the five. It turns into the five right there by um, almost um, East LA. But anyway, we were told to go there and to disembark from the buses and go to the Ivy that was right there and uh, start searching for weapons, any kind of weapons. It could be guns, it could be knives, it could be anything. But, you know, everything had to be uh, searched for in that ivy, and we had to call somebody if we found anything. So we started going at that, the whole class. And, of course, we had several people are as, uh, acting as uh, traffic uh, uh, guides for the people on the freeway, mind you, okay? So here's a couple of guys just ask, asking the people to slow down on the freeway while they're on one lane and the people are trying to veer off mm. and trying to get onto the 101 or to the, or to the 10 or, and even to the five because we were searching both sides of that thing. So they didn't tell us what we were looking for. Just said, look for anything you can find. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we are. We're looking for anything we can find. Now, we had just had two days or three days prior to that, we had had a class on uh, how to dif differentiate a uh, blood pattern as to how a droplet goes and it tells you the direction that the person is traveling. Did you go through that, Kenny? I don't recall that. Yeah, well, we did. We had uh, somebody come in and tell us, okay, if you see a blood droplet on the ground and you just drop it straight down, it just goes around. But it starts to, if it starts to move, you can tell the pattern because you can see that it's got a little line, you know, where it drops and it, 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 it tells you the direction, more or less. It looks like, um, I can't really describe it, but it looks elongated. It mm -hmm. has a little tail. And the tail is where it first lands and then the biggest part of it drops. So I was in a group of four guys that we actually started seeing blood pattern leaving the IV. So we managed to contact one of the instructors and we said, can we follow the, uh, the blood pattern? Because, you know, it looks like it's relevant. It comes from the ivy and, you know, we go from there. He said, okay, go ahead. Just, you know, be careful. Take a radio. Make sure you should let, let us know exactly where you are at all times. And, you know, if you need to cross the street, make sure two guys go on one side and two other guys go on the other side. So that's what we did. I don't remember what church it was, but there's a church off of Sunset Boulevard. It used to be Sunset Boulevard at the time, of course, changed to Chavez. And uh, that's where the drop was led to, and it, read, it, it led directly to the sacristy. So we took the address, 
and uh, he contacted our supervisors, you know, and they came over and they said, okay, you got the uh, thing, they asked for a photo. Somebody came over, took photographs of it from uh, Parker Center at the time, I guess, and started really going through what we had already observed from both sides of the street, the droplets, and they were correct. And then afterwards, we went back to the academy, heard absolutely nothing about it. 25 years later, it was all over the news that what we had actually gone through, and I recognized the pattern of this, was that uh, and I think we were told that uh, a sheriff's deputy had been driving a van after uh, in the watch going home and had crashed his van at the embutment where the freeway divided into the five and then going into the 10 from the 101. And he had died at the scene. But that's all they told us. So 25 years later, I started reading this thing uh, somewhere in which they said, yeah, uh, they finally found out that that particular deputy was a sergeant for the sheriff's department and that he had just gotten off duty from the Twin Towers or whatever uh, the place was that they were at and was on his way home. And unbeknownst to him, uh, somebody was in his van and had been drinking a six pack of beer and had shot him in the back of the head. Whoa. That caused him to collide onto that freeway abutment. So the perpetrator, the shooter, also got hurt, and, but he managed to get out. But he was bleeding. That's, those were the blood droplets that we found. So again, 25 years later, when DNA became prevalent in checking back cases and stuff like that, they went back and they found out that it was actually a sheriff's deputy that was actually a co-worker of this sheriff sergeant. And they determined that it had been a, uh, a love affair between the, uh, the deceased and the deceased's wife, I should say, and the uh, shooter. And of course they, you know, put it all together and they said, well, you know, when it came to find out, they talked to the, the, uh, widow. And they found out that after everything was said and done, that deputy had actually quit the department and, or retired and uh, went to live somewhere else. And she had absolutely no idea of how that had happened. But it also came to light that a sheriff's deputy sergeant that went to the scene with the deputies that arrived there found the six pack of empty beer, can, uh, beer cans in the back of the, the van. Mm-hmm. And thought, oh, this guy just got blottled, right? And he crashed and killed himself. Well, when the deputy coroner went over there and started looking around, he said, no, this man's dead because he's got two bullet holes or whatever in the back of his head. And by that time, guess what had happened to the beer can? They had yeah, been the- removed. Yeah, he had taken those, those beer cans because he thought, you know, the guy has just, you know, had been drunk driving and all of that. So he dumped them somewhere. And by that time, of course, he he would have been, you know, in a big heap of trouble. He didn't want to lose his job, so he kept mum about it. Ooh. But it all came out in the, you know, in, in the deal afterwards. But it took 25 years for them to find all this out. How interesting. Did they ever, um, was the guy ever prosecuted, the guy they got the DNA from? Well, actually, they contacted him in the state that he was living in. I can't remember where it was. Washington. And, was it? <laughs> yeah, Spokane. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, the thing was that they did contact him, and uh, they said that they were going to send a couple of detectives to go talk to him. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, fine. You know, And he was there when they came over, and they told him why they were there, and that they, they were actually going to go over to the local um, authorities to get the uh, extradition papers and whatnot, because they were to come back the next day for him. So he said, oh, okay, you know, he was married to somebody, they had children and all that, and uh, of course, by this time, 25 years later, his children are grown and everything else, and he's a grandpa now. So the next day, they called to let him know. He said, okay, I'll be waiting for you. So they thought, well, you know, we better be careful coming up to this guy. And nice of them to warn him. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he, uh, he wasn't there when they arrived. 
So they went over and talked to his wife, and uh, his wife said, oh, well, you know, he said he was going to go shoot some pheasants. He took mm. a shot. So they go, where, where did he go? And they had a field in back of their farmhouse or whatever it was, and just that away. So, you know, they went searching, and they found him. Not in the way that they wanted to, but they found him. Right. His, his head the took the, fe- the place of the pheasant. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting because I'm reading up on this story right now where the guy goes out <clears throat> and he uh, he kills himself. But it, the the news story says that the police said that uh, that the body was fairly decomposed, and so I'm thinking the wife, you know, hey, the guy hasn't come back in a long time. Maybe somebody should look for him. But they went out and found him. Yeah, he was he was gone for quite a long time. Oh. Yeah, wow. ninety nine. Yeah. Somewhere on there. Well, yeah. that's interesting. You have quite a quite a handle on that story. Well, we had part in it in my class anyway. The fact that we uh, started in April first, nineteen eighty five, and yeah. graduated yeah. September Friday the thirteenth. <laughs> I remember that story too. That yeah. uh, you know there was somebody lying in wait for this sheriff sergeant and uh, killed him in the back of his, you know. That was that's scary for cops, you know. That someone's hiding in the back. We always used to check our cars, make sure nobody was, you know, in the back seat. I think I still do that today. Oh, it's scary for yeah. anybody. Nobody. Wants, I check behind the shower curtains when I take a dump. I don't want. I don't want anybody <laughs> oh, hiding on me anywhere. Thanks Too much a lot, information, man. Hey, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm an open book, baby. <laughs> oh, I ain't getting shot. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's interesting. I did not know you had that connection, uh, Bill, with that uh, with that story. Big, big story. And even when they were talking about it years later, when they were saying, "Oh, they found out who did it and everything," um, I I forget that I forgot that they sometimes pulled academy classes out and just had them do grid searches looking for stuff. I never uh-huh. I never did that. It doesn't happen all that often, but but yeah. that's uh, quite a bit of history there, there, Bill. Yeah, because, you know, I had never heard of any other class doing it either. So I thought, hey, we're special. Duh. <laughs> That's great. That's something. Um, I went to a regional academy. Like the bigger agencies have, they kind of own the cadets, the recruits, because it's your agency. But um, I went to a regional agency with 15 other departments were recruits and cadets with me. And uh, they can't do stuff like that because the chiefs all chime in. Like they used to bring us all to the morgue and all this stuff. But one kid got sick and. Um, yeah, when, when you're not, um, when you're not one solid group, they really can't, uh, utilize you like that. So that's interesting that they would, ju- they would just take recruits and do that. Wow. Yeah. But you know, they didn't do the, uh, morgue with us. We were not taken to the morgue to see uh, a post or to even take a look at a dead body right there. Oh, wow. Yeah, they didn't do that. Yeah. They used to do that out here, but then someone um, in mass, but someone passed out and knocked their head on the floor, and they said, uh, "Yeah, we're not going to do this anymore." <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh! Yeah, someone got brain damage oh, from it. So, back to your previous job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember one of the classes that we had, Bill, in the academy was uh, it was just because uh, Steve, we would just get these. Uh, I don't know if it's. I think it was weekly. You'd get your class schedules. You know. Be, you have to be here in this class. And one of them was, um, it was at the end of the day, and it just said, report here uh, to the Red Cross because uh, one of your classes, you're going to get blood. That was, we weren't asked if we wanted to get blood. They were just, that was just a class. We're taking your blood today. Yeah. yeah. So. Vampires. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, nobody questioned it. You know, nobody uh-huh. questioned it. You just did what you were told, man. You're nobody. Well, it sounds a lot more like you guys were like, um, like, you know how the military, you're their property when you're in boot camp? Sounds like yeah, that's what it was like for you guys. Yes. Yeah, pretty much, except we could go home every day. Well, that's cool. Overnight yeah, academies I mean, are terrible. We'd go home and cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I'm still traumatized by all that. Good. This is good stuff, man. It brings back memories. So, yeah, Bill. Well. Yeah. Can you, uh, can you hit us with um, one of your most intense or uh, terrifying calls? Oh, most intense and terrifying calls. Well, men's humanity to men, particularly to children, is one of the most terrifying things you'll ever see. And to me, 
you know, it was very sad. Uh, again, this was at Wilshire, and I was already a P3 at the time. I had a, a young man with me as a P1. We received a call of child abuse, and uh, it was an African-American uh, family, and it was just a grandmother and had three children in the uh, in the house with her. And uh, so we went, you know, didn't know what the call was about or not. The uh, young boy comes over and opens the door. And he must have been about seven. And uh, I asked him, uh, is someone here taking care of you? And he says, yes, my grandma. Can we talk to her? He says, yeah. And he called her out. Grandma came out. And he says, what are you here for? And so we got a call of child abuse investigation. She goes, that must have been my daughter. And I said, your daughter? She goes, yeah, she's the mother of this little boy here, his sister, Michaela, and a baby. And then I proceeded to ask, okay, so uh, what might have caused her to call and put you in this predicament? He goes, well, she's the one that abuses the kids. She and her boyfriend. And she told the boy, to take his t-shirt off and just just remembering that little boy's back we saw pictures in the academy of child abuse this little boy was the epitome of it his whole back was scarred mm. with whippings with electric cords and stuff I had to hold my tears and my partner did too because we just felt ashamed to be called part of the human race if this was what it was. So she said, and he's not the only one. She called Michaela over and she goes, watch what I ask. She says, Michaela, grandma got a dick. And Michaela says, no, grandma got no dick. Grandma got pussy. Ugh. And we go like, what? How the hell does she know? She says, because she's been abused as well. And mm -hmm. Michaela was like maybe four, five years old. Mm -hmm. And she goes, Michaela, what does mama do with your little brother? Oh, she says, oh, she sucked his dick. That was the baby. Oh. I'm like, what the hell? She goes, and she, you know, uh, took us over to where the baby was in his bassinet and uh, he was fine. But luckily he had not been, you know, molested other than that. A baby. Michaela wow. is like three or four. And she already knows this because she's already been abused by her mother's boyfriend. I'm like, holy shit. Okay. I asked the grandmother, so you got custody of these children? She goes, yes. So you have custody? And she showed us the paperwork. And all that. I said, thank you, ma'am. I said, and I told the little boy, whatever happens in your life, I said, you are not to blame for what happened before. This was just wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, we were wiping our tears as we walked away from that call because that was the worst I have ever seen. I mean, we were prepared to see some shit. That was the worst as far as I was concerned. After that, everything was just easy. Wow. Yeah. How do you, how do you keep your composure? You're, you're, you're diving into that. You're in the call. It must just hit you in the head like a sledgehammer when they're, when those words are coming out of their mouth telling you this stuff. It's like surreal. It is surreal, but you know, my mom asked me when I told her, and I was 34 when I went into the academy, and she had asked me before, she says, what are you going to do? Why are you doing this? You know, you could be killed any day. I said, well, I could walk out the door and be killed by a whatever. But, you know, I have a plan. I said, you know, because you mentioned all the gore and stuff that you may see as a police officer. And I said, well, mom, I said, you know, I've made up my mind that I am a movie star and that I'm in a movie set. And whatever I see out there, whether gored or, or not, I said, I'm going to act appropriately because I have to do a job and this is a movie. And believe me, that's the only thing that kept my sanity. Mm. Because that's all shit that I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have seen at any other place. Wow. Yeah, that's, um. I often thought that too. Funny you say that about um it being a movie. Sometimes you just feel when presented with something with trauma like that or just horrible human injury or whatever, you kind of, it's so surreal. You feel like you're witnessing Hollywood um, 
gory yeah. animatronics. It's like so unreal. Yeah. I saw some news reels from World War II. Where, you know, GIs are kicking helmets. Well, that helmet's not only the helmet; it's got a head attached to it. And it's just rolling like a bowling ball, mm. and you can see that. I'm like, what the hell was that? And, you know, it kind of grabs you back when you're a kid. You're son of a bitch. You know, what is this? And then you go, shit, that was a head attached to that thing. Mm. Yeah. So and that's, the, that's the only way that I can actually say I you know, kept my sanity because we did see a lot of stuff that otherwise you would not have seen. Yeah, it's you one know, of those, it, you know, it's, it's the little kids and it's the senior citizens uh, when uh, they're preyed upon. I remember one one uh, one time uh, in Wilshire where this uh, this uh, little old lady was uh, was holding onto her purse because someone was trying to steal it, and they jumped in the car and she was holding on their purse, and they just dragged her down the street. And uh, the crime scene was very long because you know she had been scraped, uh, you know, it's like cheese grating, uh, and they dragged this little lady. Uh, for a purse and it was pretty bad but it's the, it's the little kids man we were talking um bill we were talking in another podcast uh, steve and i and it's the uh when you go in there and and you just see these little kids like the little kid that you saw and you see the uh the the uh, circular marks from the extension cords yeah. and um you just want to kill these people for doing this to a child and you just have to hold back. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you gotta do a job. You know, you're there to treat everybody equally with respect and dignity, even if they've shown none to anybody else. Yeah. It's just so sad. These children are just so innocent and they're, uh, it, it pisses me off thinking about what you saw. Brutal. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, everybody's got a story to tell. And, you know, this is one of the ones that, you know, I, I went through. But, uh, you know, happily, I had good people working with me as well. And I had good supervision that, you know, understood when we wrote the reports and everything else. And, you know, they were there also. Yeah, and, and Steve, you know, for the listeners who, who have uh, – who, who want to be police officers or just, they're just law enforcement supporters. This is a perfect example of, uh, you know, Bill still feels what he felt. This is back in the eighties and he still feels the pain that he felt back then. And police officers carry this, this stuff with them for decades. And this is just one incident. You, you combine with the hundreds of crime scenes and the things that police officers see over the years and it's a wonder that, you know, retired cops are still functioning adults. You know, they're not just whack out of their mind because that, that's, the, that's the strength that it takes to do the job and survive it after. Yeah, like you mentioned before, it's like poison. Like you said in, at roll call when they would, when you'd hear of a cop that lived to 62, everybody would clap, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. big deal, yeah. big deal. Remember, uh, remember, Bill, in roll call when they would read the uh, – um, the rotator and there was cops. And if they went past five years in retirement, Oh, everybody's like, dude, <laughs> no, you did it. Five, yeah. five years was the mark. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cause a lot of people after five years, they found themselves that they couldn't cope and they would eat their guns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, uh, that was very prevalent back in the eighties and early nineties too. Yeah. Yeah, everybody has known someone that's taken their own life in police work, active and retired people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, Bill. You, you wouldn't, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, I, I that train of thought just left. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, was going to transition to the next question here, um, try to see if you can lift us up here. Do you have a, do you have a positive situation you'd like to talk about from uh, your career? Positive situation. Well, you know, you go out there and do your job. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll tell you what. Uh, I had gone after uh, working so many years uh, in Wilshire as a P3. Um, and, uh, well, actually, I did my probation at Wilshire, and then I went over to 77th, and I did my little stint at 77th, went back to Wilshire as a P3, but not before uh, 
I went to um, Central Traffic Division, all right? And in Central Traffic Division, of course, you learn how to uh, investigate traffic collisions, and you become less and less scared about, oh, my God, is CPI, a city property involved. Because that's what used to get everybody scared whenever they didn't know what the hell they were doing on a traffic call. So, and that was one of the reasons why I got the P3 spot at Wilshire, I think. But anyway, um, as a P3, I was working uh, an L car one day, and it just so happens to be Mother's Day. <laughs> well, uh, I wanted to be a motor cop so bad <laughs> that uh, I was out there early in the morning, and uh, I had the opportunity to stop 12 young ladies. And every one that I stopped was telling me, I'm a mom. How dare you stop me? <laughs> uh, I'm on my way to a you know, Mother's Day party, and uh, you know, you're making me late. Well, my answer to all of them was, well, I'll tell you what. If I didn't stop you and give you this reminder of the stop, I said, if you continue to do this, you may not be a mother for too long because you'll be dead. You have violated so many traffic uh, rules and regulations like failure to stop for a red light, speeding, and not wearing your seatbelt, you know, a whole slew of things. And uh, they actually signed their ticket, and I never went to court on any one of them. Mm. So I can say that I had the dubious uh, notoriety of uh, having stopped 12 women and saved their lives, maybe, you know, because they were rushing to Mother's Day events that they probably would have never made. <laughs> but you're a the good funniest, man. The funniest traffic stop that I had, if you don't mind my continuing, of course, <laughs> was when I was a motor cop. And we were working nights, and uh, my partner and I had already done, you know, our share of uh, traffic sites and all that and impounds. One of the things was, you know, you can come in a little early to finish the paperwork on your impound so you can go home on time. So I'm driving back towards uh, central traffic on the motor, and uh, I happened to go by this little BMW uh, Roadster. And as I pass, I noticed that the Roadster had not only its high beams on, but also its fog lamps. It's blinding the hell out of me, and I'm just ahead of them. So I can say, you know, I can think of, how that would be uh, looked upon by traffic coming the opposite way from this guy. So I slowed down, let him pass me, and I pull him over. And my intention was just to ask him, sir, would you please turn down your lights from high beam to low beam and turn off your fog lamps? And that's exactly what I did, right? The guy tells me, I don't know how to turn them off. I don't know how to turn them down. So I said, <laughs> You bought, is this your car? And he says, yes, it is. Oh, but to make matters worse, he had a seven-year-old kid in there that was his son. And uh, he starts giving me a ration of shit right away. And he says, well, I asked him, can I see? He says, no, you may not. And you cannot. I said, okay. <laughs> hey, what you do is, you know, lower your beams down, turn off the, the damn uh, uh, fog lamps because you don't need them. I mean, there's no fog and you don't really need the light, you know. And he says, give me a ticket. Give me a fucking ticket now. I'm going to take you to court anyway. Wow. So I don't want to give you a ticket. All I want you to do is to be courteous to your fellow motorists and just lower the high beams, you know, to your normal position. I told you I don't know how to do that shit, so give me the damn ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you wow. Remember the, you remember the cheater cards? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I said, fine. I got you know, his driver's license, insurance information, registration. I go back to the motor. I start looking at the cheater, and I'm looking, oh, shit. And it said, CHP can only do this. Da, 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 da. And I'm reading. I finally found one obscure light section in there, and I wrote him for it. So I went over. I had him sign it. He tells his son, you watch me, boy. He said, I'm going to take this fucker to court, and I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You stop me. And off he goes. Yeah. I went back. Well, you know, usually it takes about a month or so before you get a subpoena, right? Or something like that. And sure enough, I got it. So I was a very prolific writer. What can I say? So I had subpoenas up the wazoo anyway. So I get over there. You remember Lasher? 
Kenny. Uh, what was the first name? I don't remember his first name, but his last name was Lasher. He was a commissioner on 45 at 1945 uh, Street. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, that was the traffic court. Anyway, this guy was the one that got paid to do all of the stuff unless he was on vacation and they, they would have uh, attorneys come in and take a spot at it. But anyway, I, I did all my stuff with him and he, he knew about this one particular one. He says, Bill, he says, you're going to have to go up uh, to the uh, eighth floor. He said, uh, because this guy has an attorney. And don't forget to get yourself an attorney from the uh, from the pool down there. And I said, okay, thanks, Your Honor. He says, oh, by the way, he says, uh, come back and tell me about this. <laughs> like okay, so I went and met my uh, my attorney from the uh, from the office there, and he says, "So how are we going to proceed?" And I said, "Like this, we're going to go up there, and when the judge says how are we proceeding, we're just going to say, Your Honor, we would like to dismiss the citation for errors of justice." <laughs> mm-hmm. And he looks at me and says, "What?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "You know, all I wanted this guy to do was lower his high beams." and turn off his fog lamps. He insisted upon getting a ticket. After so much trying not to give him one, I complied and said, so, you know, what do you think? He's got an attorney. You think he's going to feel happy about, you know, taking me to court and getting his ticket uh, dismissed? He goes, well, yeah, but I said, think about it. Who wins? Who was actually won in this thing? Did he win? Yeah, you had to pay the money to bring an attorney. Uh huh. <laughs> Not only to bring in the attorney, but he's taking time off to be in court. And so, who wins? Right? All because he didn't want to be courteous. Uh, so, you know, I went upstairs. Judge comes in. Says, "How are we pleading on this? Fairness of justice." Oh, he gets up. You know, he starts. Shaking hands with his attorney, and he says, "See, I told you he was too damn scared to even go through with it." And his <laughs> attorney says, "Yes, he was. Yes, he was." <laughs> my uh, my CA and I were like, "Yeah, okay." So I go back down and I tell Lasher, and he says, "God damn it, Bill, only you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that people was my th- most fun. Uh, people think they're making a big deal, but they don't realize the cops getting paid probably over time, and you know. It's not like you're you're taking any time. They're still on the clock. They're they're that's what they do for a living. So so what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you know this guy. All he had to do was just comply, be courteous enough to his fellow motorists, and that would have been it. I would have been grateful. I would have thanked them. Wow, Instead people of, are strange. A couple of hundred dollars or more, you know, because attorneys are expensive. Mm-hmm. Especially yeah. when they show up somewhere. Yeah, not many people take an attorney to traffic court, but hey, knock yourself out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you really believe that the officer did you wrong, by all means, you know, take it to court. Go with an attorney if that's how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bill. Oh, go ahead, Ken. No, go ahead. I was going to say traffic court's an interesting place, man. (laughs) (laughs) Go go ahead. I'm sorry. It's an angry place. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Bill, I was going to ask you, um, do you have uh, any advice for new police officers or people who are looking to get into law enforcement? Well, first of all, be in shape. Also, if you have prior, um, I would say, uh, job entanglement with the public. In other words, you're working, even if you're working at McDonald's, but you deal with the public uh, every day and you are social, you you see these people come in and you treat them the way that, uh, you would want to be treated yourself expediently. If you're doing a McDonald's job or anywhere where people come over and ask you questions, be polite, be yourself, be polite, be respectful. Know that that's going to go a long way in your career. If you do make it into police business, because people do realize that police officers are human and that they're there to help. And then, of course, there are those that don't, but, uh, you know, that's a different uh, breed of person altogether. But keep yourself clean, keep yourself uh, in shape, and uh, learn as much as you can about the um, makeup of 
the area that you're going to be patrolling because there are all races out there and you have to be aware of what constitutes an insult and whatnot, you know. And you can do this uh, just by watching the people. In fact, uh, I think on ride-alongs, my, uh, one of my classmates, you remember Curtis Woodle? Yeah. Okay. Big guy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We went over to Hollenbeck the day before we were supposed to report to Wilshire. Uh, I was supposed to report to Wilshire. He went somewhere else. I think he went to Newton. <clears throat> but uh, we were riding along uh, with people from Hollenbeck, and uh, the uh, Hollenbeck officer and his uh, partner that took me on the ride along decided they wanted to go to this particular shop. And sure enough, uh, we went in there, and I could actually hear the lady on the talk to her husband says, oh, he, in, in Spanish, she said, ah, oh, here comes this bunch of thieves. Mm. And I actually didn't understand why she said that, but I did ask her in Spanish, why did you say that? And then she actually was taken aback because I actually spoke the language. And she said, well, not you, particular, she says, but there have been some other coppers that come in here and they just take stuff and don't pay. And I said, well, no, we pay. And she goes, no, some of them don't. And I said, is it in the blue uniform like this? And she goes, well, some of them are in blue uniform and some of them are in the green and uh, khaki. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So when I went back to the station, I made up with Curtis again. I said, hey, did you... uh, do you ever have any situation like that? And says, not me, he says, but I think another one of our classmates did in exactly the same scenario. He was from uh, Singapore, and uh, he said that, and he was Indian by descent, but he was actually raised in Singapore. <clears throat> and he said he went into uh, an Indian uh, a store, and in their dialect, they spoke to each other, and he understood that, and it was the same thing. Here come the Steves. So some people in business saw us as thieves. Some people in business saw us as someone that was there to protect them. But it all depended on who that person was and who it, who it was really, you know, is how you behave. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Bill, Interesting. can I test out a new question on you? Never asked of any TPS guests before. Yeah. Oh, here it goes. Oh, cool. I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> I feel like a special guest, so I'm going to try it out. Uh, can you tell us about a time that you were involved with the police before you were a cop? Like maybe a time you got in trouble with the cops? You know, I was very fortunate in my life that all I got was tickets. Just traffic stuff? Just traffic stuff, yeah. And I was I was barely 14 and a half when my mom bought me my first car. Wow, 14 and, and a half. <clears throat> Is, you know, was the age yeah. lower back then for driving? <laughs> no, it had never changed. It had to be 15 at least. But, um, yeah, she bought me the car when I was uh, almost 15. And the reason she bought it for me was because uh, my sister, who was 10 years older than I, uh, was pregnant. And uh, my mom said that we need to have a car so that if anything happens and she needs to get to the hospital, you'll be able to do it. And I was very fortunate enough that I had friends that had taken me to parks and had te- had taught me uh, how to drive a car. So she bought me this whole 59 Ford Fairlane hardtop convertible with nice. no reverse. With wow. <laughs> Killer. <laughs> no reverse. No reverse, yeah. So if you needed to park somewhere, you knew it had to be uphill because <laughs> the, the gravity was the only thing that moved the damn thing yeah. back. But yeah. <laughs> 58, 59... Ford Fairlanes, awesome. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Gas hogs, but you know, in those days, it really didn't matter because it was twenty-five cents a gallon. <laughs> yeah. Isn't there a isn't there a law in California that if you get a note from something and you can and your your parents need medical care, you can get a license at fifteen or so? Is that is that a law? I believe you can, uh, and it's mostly in rural areas also that you can get a driver's license so that you can drive yourself to school. Uh, 
Unlike uh, Bill and I, who had to walk uh, to school 10 miles, well, up. in the snow, even though it didn't <laughs> snow in California. Uphill both ways in somehow. Blizzard. Yeah, in even blizzard, though there yeah. no hills and no snow, but we still had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. This is a long time ago. Bill, I think you're a little older than me, but I still, uh, we still uh, are in the same, you know, age bracket. So we have a lot of the same memories. Yeah, well, I'm 68, going on 69. Yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to be 62 in March. So uh, we just gave ourselves away here. Steve, you young buck, you. Yep. 40, baby. I'm just a, I'm just a baby. It's all over it's 40. Uh, still wiping those not off your nose, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't feel that young. I was throwing the ball for my dog yesterday, and I threw my arm out. And uh, I used to be quite a good – well, I used to have a good arm. I used to play baseball, and now I feel like uh, whew, quite the Nancy boy. It hurts to raise my arm above my head. So I think yeah. 40s officially hit. Stop being such yeah. a Nancy. <laughs> it's a Nancy boy. <laughs> well, Bill, yeah, th- those, were, uh, those were awesome stories, man. Yeah. Yeah, very good, yeah. very good stories. I had actually started writing a book, and I have copious notes about the stuff that happened. So if you guys need something else, just let me know, and I'll look it up and see if I have it. Excellent. We're not opposed to repeat guests, that's for sure. Oh, okay. Hey. Then, you know, by all means, just let me know when. And uh, don't forget that I will go for surgery on the 27th of the month. That's so I'll right. i it for a while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill has a surgery coming up here, Steve. Uh, similar to what I uh, actually exactly what I went through. So, um, good luck to you on that. I know God's with you, Bill, and uh, everything's going to be great. Thank you. Thank right. you, and I'm glad that uh, you finally came out of the closet and said, "Hey, I had that." <laughs> <laughs> Ken's gay. What's happening? Uh, what? <laughs> you uh, know. And kind of tend to be a little bit quiet about stuff that happens to us, you know, and it's yeah. not really a good idea because even our own family members would like to know what's going on so that if it happens to them, at least they have a certain idea. And, you know, for the longest time, I thought I didn't have anything wrong with me until a few months ago last year that uh, by pure coincidence, I went to the doctor because I was having a pain on my belly. And uh, the doctor says, I think you have diverticulitis and I need you to have a CT scan and it has to be done now so that we know how to treat it. And boom, I'm in the hospital there taking Varium. And then uh, two hours later, I'm in the uh, CT scan with dye or contrast is what they call it. And then eventually I am on my way home and the doctor calls me and he says, Disregard the medication I prescribed for you. Do not take it, but do read the message that is on your email for you through our website. My wife and I looked at each other and went, what the hell's going on? So I came home, read the message, and all it said was, go to a urologist immediately. And like, what? So, okay. So I set up an appointment. I went over, and the guy shows me the CT scan, and he says, it's your prostate. It says you have a lump in your prostate, although the prostate itself is uh, normal size, not enlarged, but this little lump up here is of concern to me. And it says, well, what do we do? It says, we need a biopsy. Okay. So the, the biopsy was finally done, and the results were that, yes, it was cancer. Ooh. But then I said, you know, I, I read in uh, Facebook that some of my ex-coworkers, my retired ex-coworkers, had that, but they came out and said, you know, thank God I'm free of cancer. But they didn't say from what, they didn't say anything about what the procedures were or anything like that. So I thought, okay, I am going to go one step further because I know that if I was as unaware of this as I think everybody else might be, I'm going to post it to my friends on Facebook. And you know what? Kenny came out and said, Bill, I was there, da, da, da. But I didn't know what your circumstances were, Kenny. Well, it's the same thing. It was the uh, uh, just doing the PSA test, the yearly blood test. I had a, a prostate infection, and the number, the PSA kept going up over gradually over over a few weeks. And they did a biopsy, came out that I had prostate cancer. This was in uh, September 2017. 
January 2018, had radiation seeds, 160-something radiation seeds uh, were implanted in the prostate to kill the cancer. And that was uh, two years ago this month. And so I just recently came back from the doctor. The, the PSA went down significantly over the last few months, and it looks like I beat it. So uh, uh, you, you, now you are, you are going the surgery route, but um, yeah, definitely uh, for men, um, they need to check their PSA every month. And it's just uh, police officers are, are some of the worst people to go see the doctors, but do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And here's the other one, too. Your PSA does not have to be high in order yeah. for it to be a danger zone because mine was below normal, completely below normal. Like I said, if it hadn't been for the fact that I had something else going on and, and, and a CT scan was taken, I would have never known, neither would my doctor. Because mm. everything, as so far as that was concerned, I was in perfect health. Nothing wrong. And I had no obstructions. I had no pain, nothing. So this was just like one of those flukes, right? But imagine that. Some of these flukes could actually be happening to a whole bunch of other men that are out there that don't know about it. And let's face it, once you get after 45 or 40, you should start you know, being a little bit careful about stuff like that, even though your PSA may not be high. Have the doctor do other checks. You know? And if a uh, digital rectal exam is not your thing, well, you know what? <clears throat> it's the only way they can check it because we don't have anything else that we can do to check that. Yeah. You got to mm -hmm. get over that. It's just going to happen. Yeah. yeah. It's going to happen. I mean, you know, after I had the biopsy, my wife says, how do you feel? And I said, I'm not a virgin anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> When's your um, surgery? Is it this month? Yeah. The 27th of this month. 27th. I'll pray for you, brother. And you're well, going to be in the hospital for a day. Absolutely. That's what I was told. Uh, we have the date. We don't have the time yet because they have to schedule it. But I've yeah. seen my uh, I've seen my urologist, and yesterday I saw my uh, anesthesiologist. Yeah. So we're all set to go. It's just a matter of you know what time. Good, good. And uh, Steve, I keep up with Bill on Facebook, so he's he's real good about posting this information for men for for um, you know cancer awareness. So um, it's uh, there's no secrets. It's uh, it's got to be done. And uh, Bill's a real good proponent of giving this getting the story out there in his journey. Uh, is uh, means a lot to a lot of men because um, I remember when I when I had it we were working backgrounds and I was I I said I'm gonna I'm gonna let men know about this that what's going on and there were five men that came up to me and you know all of them Steve they all came up and said I, I went remember. and got my prostate checked uh, my prostate uh, my PSA checked because of what you said and they all came back good but the fact that they did that. Mm -hmm. was important to me and Bill's doing the same thing. So I just want to, I, I, I'll be in prayer for you, Bill, for your surgery. Surgeries are just surgeries or surgeries. Are, there's no, no easy one. surgery. Yeah. No, so it, it, it's just one. It's uh, actually the entire removal of the prostate. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying surgeries are, there's no, uh, surgeries are, are uh, dangerous procedures. It's a full on no. surgery. It's not, you know, yeah, no, it's a full on surgery. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's what we discussed yesterday with the uh, anesthesiologist. Yeah. Good, good. We all be in our prayers, for sure. Well, thank Absolutely. You so thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Bill. It's been an honor to hear your uh, your stories from LAPD. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Anytime you want to have me again, please do so. I would be more than happy to talk to you. Excellent. Yeah, it's been good catching up with Bill. I haven't uh, heard that silky that silky Latin <laughs> voice in a long time. Uh, <laughs> and that you guys want mug. me to exit the conversation or you go? <laughs> uh, Leave yeah, you guys alone? Good time. <laughs> Some alone time, yeah, please. No, no, it's good to see you, man. Good to hang out with you here. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you'd like to support the show, go over to thingspolicey.com. Uh, when you get on the website, there's a few different ways you can show some support. You can uh, donate directly. You can do a one-time donation or a, a monthly donation. Um, even a buck um, helps us uh, keep the lights on over here and pays our expenses for the month. is greatly appreciated. You can also just use our Amazon affiliate link. If you just want to buy something on Amazon like you normally do, just do it through our link, and um, we'll get a little kickback for that. So you can go to the website and do that or... Uh, in the show notes, I'll put a link. You can just click right through that link. And the third way is you can buy some uh, you can buy some merch. So we have um, coffee mugs, 
We have t-shirts, men's and women's, and we also have hoodie sweatshirts now. So uh, go over to thingspleasesee.com and check it out. You can also just um, listen to the podcast there, or you can apply to be a guest. Just scroll down to and click on be a guest. And what you want to do is just give us a brief uh, synopsis of your of your service, how many years you uh, were on the job, and uh, just a very brief idea of the stories you'd like to share, and I will get right back to you. So thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time.